Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today is Dr. Vera Tarman, and she is going to be talking about why sugar and processed food are addictive and how they can actually lead to developing a food addiction. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to see you again. You're really my favorite person in this space of food addiction because you this is this is what you do and I think you know so much about it and I love that you share about it. Uh, thank you Chef AJ for asking me to speak again. I always appreciate having the opportunity to speak to your audience about this. So I thank you so much. I, I guess I should just jump in. Yeah, eh? absolutely. But who's that cute nurse behind you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, she's my she's my therapy dog. Her name is Maddie, and I take her with me everywhere. And even on my talks, she's with me. She's actually by by the floor, but there she is in her outfit. She's yeah, so cute. Is is she a Maltese? She's a Maltese mix. It's called a Miki M I K I, and you the, the the place you get them is actually in the U S. So it, it's a wonderful breed. She is just precious. Thank dogs, you. Dogs don't develop food addictions, do they? Or at least not not in nature, I'm sure. No, no. And, and in fact, I mean, I see a lot of dogs that will eat anything, but she's a very picky eater. So she's like not a food addict at all. Like I kind of <laughs> train her with treats. She just looks at them and looks away. On that level, we don't share much at all because I'm not <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'd love to see your presentation. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll start. Um, so the, I, I've spoken um, to you before and your audience, but what I thought I would talk about today more specifically is why um, quitting sugar and uh, UPF stands for ultra processed foods <clears throat> um, is, is a valuable topic. And <clears throat> I, I've, you know, I've subtitled it the no one size fits all food plan because outside of the fact of just quitting sugar, uh, it, it, this perspective applies to anybody in, um, who's eating anything like it, it's as long as it's not a sugary food plan, it, it can be worked with. So I want to talk about um, a, get a little bit of the problem and then some of the solution. So quitting sugar and ultra processed food, I generally say, use the word food addiction. And it is now as we're trying to make this a clinical diagnosis, because it isn't yet, we're trying to cut, decide upon a term, should we call it food, should, sugar addiction, food addiction, ultra processed food addiction. And there is uh, more and more of a consensus now amongst those of us in the field that we should probably land on the term ultra processed food addiction, because that sort of is the umbrella that covers all sorts of uh, different types of foods. And it is really where the biggest problems are. When I speak in a general way, uh, I like the term just food addiction, because I think that more than processed food can be, you can be addicted to even carrots, you can be addicted to just eating too much, or restricting too much. So it's actually more than just the food or, or sugar and processed food. But this is a good starting point, And it's a good compromise amongst the many divisions in this field, like there are in every field. So I'm going to say processed food addiction. And then the no one size fits all that, that it, this will fit any plan. This will fit a vegan plan. This will fit a, um, a, a meat-based plan. This will fit just general eating. Uh, people don't want to choose a particular plan, uh, but they just want to know how to eat more healthy. Th that, that's what I'm going to explain to you, why, why it is that some foods are more healthy than others, and particularly some foods are less healthy. Um, so before I get into it, just so that you know a little bit about um, where I'm coming from, I have a book called uh, Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction that talks a lot about what I'm going to talk about today. And I have a Facebook group, I'm Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life, which if you decide you really want to quit sugar, and you want to be in a, a, a program that focuses on that alone, um, it does that it's free. And I also have a podcast uh, that's called Food Junkies Podcast. Um, okay, so, so Processed food addiction, you know, what is it? It's anything that you can see behind you there, pizzas, popcorn, um, ice cream, candy. I mean, it's, it's, it's what's in, it's basically anything that's not fruits and vegetables and uh, uh, proteins and fats. Um, I, I want to say if anybody is interested in learning more about this area, I don't usually include the literature, but I'm going to today. There's um, a processed food addiction by Joan Iflin. 
that is a nice sort of academic tome that gives a lot of the research and a more recent one uh, similar uh, by Claire Wilcox called Food Addiction, Obesity and Disorders of Overeating. This gives you a lot of the science. So that I'm not talking, this is not just a bunch of people saying this is, it's, it's based on science. It's often suppressed science, science that's not highlighted, but it is based, still basic science. Um, and of late, this is why I'm focusing on processed food. If you haven't read this book called Ultra Processed People uh, by uh, Chris Van Tulliken, it's a definite must read because it tells you about the fact that it can be just the fact of processing that causes addiction, not even the fact that it's sugary. Uh, so let's dive into some of the science now or the thinking behind the science. I'm not going to focus on scientific studies. Um, that is in those books that I mentioned and also in my book. So when we talk about disordered eating, there's two areas that we want to focus on. There's the hormonal uh, endocrine area, and that includes the, um, I'm going to move myself down here just for a second so that you can see better. Um, there's the uh, hormonal model of, of um, the drives to eat, which include ghrelin, insulin, and leptin, and the neurochemical um, uh, in the brain, which includes dopamine, serotonin, and endorphin. And those are sort of two dimensions of that can that, that explain why it is that we eat and why it is that we like the foods that we eat and how they can be dearranged, both levels by the processed food industry. Both of them will um, look like food addiction, but it's the bottom one that has to be included to be officially food addiction. But the top one can be deranged uh, just by the processed food industry, you might not be a food addict. And so you can actually eat um, uh, pretty much anything. But if you're eating processed foods, it gets harder and harder to control your eating. So I want to talk about that first, because if you live in 2023 and you eat at grocery shops and you're not sort of eating the, your own, if you're not being really careful about the foods that you're eating, you're more than likely having some problems with uh, the top layer. So let me talk a little bit about ghrelin, insulin, and leptin. These are the hormonal drives to eat. Um, and then I'll talk about the addiction piece. They both actually um, uh, contribute to this whole picture of food addiction. So the hormonal part is the um, uh, hormones that we have that make us want to eat. And let me just see if I have my diagram. No, I guess I don't in this one. Okay. So Ghrelin is the hormone that is released in the stomach. This is just normal behavior um, when a person eats uh, food and has eaten food and the stomach is now emptying over a period of hours. The stomach empties and ghrelin is the hormone that's released from the stomach telling you um, through hunger pangs and feelings of discomfort of hunger that you're hungry and it's time to fill up. Um, so it's it's uh, a mechanical measure of how emptying your stomach is. So it, it's like a little alarm, uh, like uh, like on, on your watch or something that's saying, hey, I'm hungry. Uh, it's not something that's going to make you dominate. Uh, it, it, you're not going to be thinking about food all the time. You're just aware that you're a bit hungry. And the hungrier you get, the, the louder that um, bell rings, as it were. And so then you eat something. And, and over the course of about 20 minutes, as the stomach is filling from the foods that you're eating, we have the other hormone um, on the other side there, leptin. And leptin is our satiety hormone. And that is uh, our, what that sense of fullness that you have after you, you've eaten and you don't want to eat anymore because you're full and it takes about 20 minutes and that's leptin doing its job and it's kind of like ghrelin and leptin are like the yin and yang of appetite you, you, you need the ghrelin to be hungry and you need the leptin to fill up and if you're eating real food like fruits and vegetables proteins fats uh, and plenty of those then it works perfectly. And I do have a diagram here that I call the uh, hunger. I hope I have it. There we go. The hunger scale. Oops, whoops, whoops. Sorry about that. Um, the hunger scale, which I think is an excellent way to visualize this, that you'll see that on one end uh, over there, um, there's the extremely hungry realm. That's when I'm so hungry, I'll eat anything and I don't have no questions. I'm so hungry. It's just in front of me. I'll eat it and I'll eat it very quickly. And then all the way over to where my head is the, the uh, 
um, sick end, number 10, where I'm so full, I don't want to eat anymore. Ghrelin and leptin are in the four to seven. So ghrelin, hunger, hunger pangs, but not terrible, just there. Enough that if it's getting down to three, which is hungry, then I'm going to make a point to eat. And then I eat and then I'll eat to full. If I was really hungry, I might stuff myself, but I'm not going to go to 10. I'm not going to be, why would I eat to the point of feeling sick? So four to seven is what we call food sobriety or food serenity. And when you're trying to eat in a way that is good, if you're not um, so hungry that you'll eat anything, but just just that a four, that's great. And then you stop at a seven or eight, that's great. It's great and left in, and it works perfectly in a real food environment. Nothing else is called upon, it, it's not necessary. Now there are actually other hormones that are not important for this conversation that do relate to hunger and satiety like um, CCK and um, a glucagon and a glucagon-like factor. Uh, um, these are important when we talk about medications, like the most recent medication, Ozempic. Um, Ozempic sorry, um, but they're not relevant to this conversation. I don't want to co overly complicate things. So basically, grain and leptin, perfect, and that's where we want to be. And if we eat real food, that's where we go. However, when we eat processed food, when we eat junk food, when we eat sugar or processed food, uh, then often what happens is, is people will land up over into the extremely hungry or to the sick. And then they start behaving in ways that look like food addiction or some sort of addictive behavior. Something funny is going on. And what the funny is, is that's going on is actually insulin. So I'm just going to go back to our, our uh, chart here. So greater than leptin, perfect. Insulin is actually supposed to be a satiety hormone. But when we're eating processed food, when we're eating um, bad food, I'll explain why this happens. Insulin gets called upon and then it's what makes people eat um, insanely and then to the point of feeling stuck. Uh, if you've heard the term hypoglycemic, that's what's happening. You, you, your sugar becomes so low and then it becomes so high and th there's a, just a, a big mess that's happening. So insulin, if I can just say a couple of words about that, um, it's a transporter molecule. And um, what happens is when you're eating um, foods uh, that are carbohydrates, so we're talking now about carbohydrates. Let me just jump back here, sorry. The, the gradient and leptin is about whatever you're eating, whether it's proteins, fats, or carbohydrates, just whatever fills the stomach. Insulin is specific to carbohydrates only. And I'm assuming most people know this, but just for the point of um, instruction, I'll say, you know, we have three categories of foods, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And proteins are all of the, uh, uh, you know, meats, cheese, dairy, um, um, leg legumes, um, soy, like it, it's basically all of the proteins. It's not carbohydrates. And then fats are oils and avocado. Well, avocado is more than just that, but it has a lot of fat in it. Um, nuts, stuff like that. So carbohydrates is where the insulin is focused. And uh, the importance of this is that our brain requires glucose to survive. It needs fuel, it needs oxygen, and it needs the fuel of glucose to survive, uh, to be alive. And I need to have carbohydrates to give, give me that fuel. Now, some people follow what's called a keto diet, and they avoid the whole carbohydrate complex by just eating proteins and fats. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that today, because that's a backup system. And it is um, uh, a system that you can rely on, but it's not necessary and and um, it's not the most common one. But the, the body actually prefers glucose. And when there is no glucose in sight, because you're following a diet that's only proteins and fats, or you're fasting and uh, there, you're, not, you're not eating anything, um, then you'll be relying on your own proteins and fats. That's how people lose weight, like the, with the fat and then the protein. Um, and then we're relying on this other backup system of fuel that's called ketones. But when you when we're not using that, just looking at food, the body always prefers glucose and carbohydrates, which is where insulin is, um, is basically a bunch of glucose molecules um, tied together. And it can be a simple carbohydrate like sugar, which is the most simple, or it can be a simple carbohydrate like candy or or chips or um uh, bread or um, toast, muffins, cake, that kind of stuff. That's all just a few 
carbo uh, glucose is tied together. Uh, but then if you eat something like broccoli or Brussels sprouts or um, like like vegetables for the most part, uh, yeah, vegetables, then it's complex carbohydrates. And the body prefers complex carbohydrates. There's something called the glycemic index. Do I have a copy of that here? Yes, I think I did. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's something called a glycemic index, which is a measure of how quickly foods break down into glucose, how quickly carbohydrates break, break down into glucose. This conversation is important because this will explain why insulin is such a uh, important drive to insane eating. So um, in a normal course of good food, I want to eat foods like Brussels sprouts and broccoli and, and like good vegetables and, and uh, fruits that are not so sugary. I don't want to eat too many sugary uh, um, fruits, but anyway, like berries um, and apples uh, th that are not that sugary. I, I want to eat foods like that because it, the, the body wants to break down all of those those tied the, that complex carbohydrate that's multiple uh, uh, glucoses together it wants to break it down slowly over the course of two hours or more so that i get fuel over the steady fuel over the course of two hours or three hours and the ghrelin will they'll tell me okay it's been two hours it's been three hours great and the insulin is quietly humming in the background making sure that um uh, it's taking the, the glucose that i've been breaking down because i'm eating uh, complex carbohydrates nice to my, um, it's a transporter molecule, it's taking the glucose to my brain and to my fat cells and all the rest of it in a nice steady pace, just as I need it. And then by the time it's all done, three or four hours later, Graylin tells me it's time to eat again. Um, so that's perfect. That's a perfect system. So we want to be eating foods that are, I don't know if you can uh, see here, look in the in this chart here, in the dark green, that where it says 10, those are, that that is what's considered um, the best of the glycemic index foods. So that would be like, like the greens, like the cabbage there. Um, if you eat fish, that would be fish, a tomato, um, if you eat uh, cheese, it, it, it's basically what we would call in, in the food world, the keto world. And that doesn't have to mean meat, by the way, you can be a, a plant based keto eater. Uh, but you're, you're choosing foods that are uh, taking a while to break down, not all at once. So if you notice uh, uh, the slightly less green, but still green, you've got cherries and you've got pickles. And I don't know what that is, but it looks like a peach or something. That's that's OK, too, because it's going to take a while to break down. So it's that steady breakdown. Perfect. What you don't want to be is in the red, which you notice there is the muffin and the cake and the beer and the bread. Um, and then the, the burger. And for some people, they can't tolerate potatoes. That, that stuff is, it's pretty close to sugar and it breaks down within or less than two hours, like considerably less than two hours, sometimes 20 minutes, like cake and 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 uh, beer. That, that, I mean, that's glucose all of a sudden. You don't want punches of it. You want to have a steady uh, trickle. So glycemic index is really important for um, insulin steady pace of, of foods that you're eating. And, uh, you know, here's here's a, a, a graph here where I show you want the black line, which is that steady release of glucose as opposed to the phew, super high and then you crash. Um, and that would come from eating all of the processed foods. Basically, we process our own foods or our food industry processes it for us. And if I buy something like processed food, it's done it for me and I get that glucose all at once, which is not good. Um, I want to be able to process it myself, like in the block, that is perfect. Um, because uh, when, when you get the whole punch of it all at once, the insulin is overworked and we it eventually becomes so overworked because it's only supposed to be the black line. It's only supposed to be doing it steadily over two hours. When it's a huge amount, it's, uh, it's overtaxed. And then eventually the insulin receptors become um, uh, dysregulated and what we call insulin resistant. They just don't work that well anymore. Uh, and then eventually you end up getting what we call diabetes. So insulin resistance is the cause of diabetes. And although definitely diabetes is a genetic, there is a, a genetic component to that. It is largely dietary. And even if you are diabetic, if you eat foods that um, are complex carbohydrates and you follow that black line, then you will um, 
take care of your diabetes because the diabetes is a consequence of these ups and downs and then the uh, insulin receptors getting walloped and damaged. They will eventually repair themselves or you get new ones once you're a diabetic and you're eating properly. This is why fasting um, uh, is a very quick way to heal, although it, it's not a necessary way. Personally, I don't like the concept of fasting. I, I think it's a dangerous concept for uh, somebody in new recovery. So I don't think it's necessary, but in any case, the idea is you want to get away from the, the uh, uh, wallops of sugar, which come from refined carbohydrates. Um, so so, uh, so now I've just explained um, ghrelin and leptin and then insulin, the way you want insulin to work, which is a slow, steady thing. Now, when you're doing the wallops of, of, uh, of sugar, you're going to get, uh, we just got to find my diagram here. You're going to get the sugar spike because that's the same as the, the glycemic index is you get it all uh, all the sugar all at once instead of over the course of four hours. And then within half an hour, you're crashing. And hypoglycemia means you're hungry. And you're hungry, your fuel is down, you're agitated, you're angry, what we call hangry. And now you're going to eat in a way that is not normal. Not like the Graylin leptin, nice way of eating. It's the, I will eat anything um, as, as quickly as possible. So then we're going to get this diagram of, I'm going to eat I'm going to be so hungry. Um, I'll be at that one. I mean, I'm actually not any hungrier than the Grayland, but I'm going to feel really hungry. And then I'm going to eat so much that I'm sick because I'm just trying to regulate. And this is, this is a problem with insulin. And the insulin would not be deranged if we ate non-processed food. It's the processed food that makes a person like this. Uh, so, um, uh, basically the first um, leg of food addiction, although it's truly not addiction, this is just a normal physiological, biological response to the foods that you're eating. And if you stop eating those foods, you'll be normal again, but it's going to look like food addiction. Um, uh, if you follow um, a fast or a keto plan, which is low carb, higher protein, um, or I, I don't even know if you have to, like, you know, what is keto? It's, it's a um, low carbs of 20 grams to 50 grams. Um, we eat in, in our general society, like 150 grams of carbohydrates. If you just cut down to 100 or 80, which is not officially keto, it's just more low carb. It's, we just call it low carb in the context of the larger society. If we just call it real foods, fruits and vegetables, you're doing really well for yourself. You may not have to go to those extremes. I think those extremes might be helpful if you're already so badly um, damaged, like you're diabetic, you've got metabolic syndrome, you've got all sorts of things, you've got cancer, you're starting to get Alzheimer's, like you're sick. You might need a more radical, um, uh, drastic intervention. But if you're not there yet, just getting rid of the processed foods, especially the, the liquid stuff like pop, soda, um, you're gonna do yourself a big favor and alcohol too, by the way. Uh, you're gonna do yourself a big favor and then you'll get back to the normal glucose running in the background and the ghrelin leptin doing its job. That's basically the hormonal model. So that's what I've talked about so far. I'm just gonna jump back to so that you can see where we were. Um, uh, the, the, I've talked about ghrelin, insulin, and leptin. The second tier, uh, and this is where addiction does kick in, is dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins. And the second tier um, is the all the research that uh, refers to, you know, rats will choose cocaine over um, uh, sugar over cocaine. They'll choose sweetener over cocaine. Um, they'll. Um, this this is where we. Um, fantasize about food and let it take over our mental landscape. This is where we behave in ways, not just eating like up to, to the point of 10 stuff, but fantasizing about food to the point where I don't want to go out tonight. I'd rather just take my tub of, of ice cream and watch Netflix all night. And basically my life revolves around food. This is what happens to people eventually. They, they might start with the uh, first behaviors that I talked about earlier, but if they're continually um, eating processed foods, it's not just the insulin that gets deranged, it's the dopamine also that gets deranged. So how does that happen? Um, we have, I mentioned ghrelin um, and leptin as the, the, the perfect 
scenario. When you start to get hungry, that little bell that's warning you that, hey, it's time to eat, you'll notice at the same time as you're getting the, you know, grumbling in your stomach, um, how you can remember ghrelin is ghrelin and grumbling. Um, it, it, there's a tie between ghrelin and dopamine. Uh, like there's a link between so that you'll notice that you're starting to think about the food. You're hungry a little bit and you're just thinking, yeah, I wonder what I'm going to have to eat. Uh, even as I'm talking about food now, I bet you you thought about food. Your mouth might start watering or something like that. this is all the, the body is kind of preparing now. Oh, something's going to happen. That's dopamine. Dopamine is our neurochemical of excitement and pleasure and anticipation. What will this be like? What will I have? I can't wait until all that stuff. That happens with Graylin naturally, but not tremendously. It's just there. So here I am talking, but you know, it's 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 uh, twelve thirty my time. My my lunch is coming up in a little bit. I'm thinking about my my uh, dinner, um, like it's it or lunch or whatever it is. Um, that's normal, uh, but it's not taking over. I'm not like saying, okay, Chef AJ, I gotta go. <laughs> or eating a pizza while I'm talking or something like that, because it, I have control. I have actual control and it's it's all good. Insulin though, if I'm eating, if, if I'm in that other uh, system where it's going up and down and up and down and, and my insulin is deregulated, uh, it's gonna trigger this uh, dopamine even more because insulin is also uh, got a backdoor to, to dopamine. And when you're super hungry, you'll notice that all you can think about is food. It's not just, oh my God, I'm so hungry, I feel terrible. It's, oh my God, um, I can't wait until I, in fact, can I just you know, close off now and go and get something to eat? Like it takes over and it has to, because if my, ins if my blood sugar is dropping and dropping and dropping, especially for a diabetic where there's no curves, they can drop to the point of zero and death. Well, actually I think it, it only, um, and anyway, you can die. Uh, from hypoglycemia. I mean, it, it's essentially a, a, a coma and then you die. Um, you will have the dopamine warning you ahead. So, so it's like a bell, but it's not just a little ring. It's like an alarm bell ringing. And that alarm bell um, it, it is making you feel very agitated, very angry, very upset. And also all you can think about is food and the most amazing delicious food available like it's it, it's it's well, i shouldn't say delicious because it's, it's it's drug foods it's it's uh it, it, you're thinking about ice cream and and all all the stuff that you don't really want to eat but you need it then because it's high in glucose and it's available it's that bang that you need because your sugar is so low uh so there's a back door with uh uh, uh insulin and it's stronger than ghrelin so if you're living in the land of insulin deregulation, that means your dopamine is frequently high. And this is a key important piece with addiction. Um, when your dopamine is frequently high, um, you eventually, just like you become insulin resistant, when you have too much sugar in the system, you eventually will become dopamine resistant. Like it will respond to the excess in the same way as your body will respond to the excess of sugar. But instead of calling it diabetes, we call it addiction. It's a very similar phenomena, but it's happening in the brain. Uh, so when you become dopamine resistant, we actually call that tolerance. And the development of addiction is uh, uh, basically because of the dopamine responding. And so I'm just gonna show you uh, another diagram here. And there's the excess dopamine. Um, um, no, okay. I guess I, I don't know if I have that diagram here right now, but um, here, here's, a, here's um, a study that just, or a diagram that really illustrates what's happening. It, um, it's all about dopamine. Dopamine is, like I said, our neurochemical of excitement and anticipation. If I take a drug like cocaine or that rat takes a drug like cocaine, um, it, it, it is getting more dopamine uh, and that, excess dopamine makes me feel not just good and I'm looking forward to something, but really good and super excited about things. And that's, and that's a pleasurable feeling. And that feeling is dopamine. And food will give us that, but cocaine will give us that more. But what this diagram doesn't show is, it just says food, but it doesn't say sugar. Because if it was sugar, then it would be equivalent to the cocaine. And if it's sugar in the form of liquid sugar, that's alcohol and that's uh, pop, soda, it would be um, even higher. Uh, because 
basically food and cocaine are pretty much the same, but cocaine has a leg up on, on regular food because you get an immediate uh, amount of cocaine because you're snorting it or you're injecting it or smoking it. You get it to the brain very quickly. Well, food generally takes, thanks to the ghrelin and leptin, about 20 minutes to process. But if I do it in the form of liquid, now if I could smoke it, that would be even better for the brain for addiction, but uh, in the form of liquid, super. And if it's super processed where it's really fast to the brain, we're getting close to, you know, the leg up that cocaine has is now becoming neutralized, it's equal. And then if I do a lot of it, so that's a binge. And when a person's not having a binge, it's not just a slow eating, they're shoveling it in quickly. They're getting a ton of food. So it's gonna equal the cocaine or even more than the cocaine. And when you have that, what you're really doing is chasing the dopamine. You're not chasing the food, you're chasing the dopamine. You're raising up that. And just like with cocaine, alcohol, cigarettes, anything, you become tolerant. You need more to get the same effect. The very same thing happens with food, uh, typically sugar and processed food. Now, I'm sure I have a diagram. I'm not sure. Yeah, there we go. Here, I, This is a, a very useful slide. So here, here's a, a, a sort of mapping of uh, dopamine. And when we have normal dopamine, because normal, we all have dopamine, it's essential. The, the, we generally see it as we have about 100 to 200 units a day. I mean, this is based on rat research, but let's just, just um, metaphorically see it this way. One, one or 200 units a day, uh, which are normal. And occasionally, like five, six, 10 times in a lifetime, you get a bit more, which we often call the spiritual experience. And those are meant to be occasional inspirational things to get us through the rest of life um, but if you take drugs you get basically spirituality on demand you get dopamine that is in the higher realms of 400 crystal meth there fentanyl a thousand and sugar is around the same category as this uh, the the royal blue box there, nicotine, opiates, alcohol, cannabis, refined sugar, and in the two to 400 range. You just got to eat a lot of it. And if it's refined, great. That's why it's it fits in. It fits in like all these other drugs as a drug. And when you have this exposure, this constant exposure, um, these are just some, uh, you start to develop this phenomena that we call addiction. Dopamine at higher rates is not just anticipation, it's obsession and craving. It's just dopamine um, uh, overblown. Then you get basically dopamine um, uh, resistance, which is tolerance. You, you need more to get the same effect because the brain is, it, it's trying to protect itself by saying there's too much. So we're going to make whatever you're having feel normal. But of course you want more because you want that feeling of extra. And then you just end up having more. But of course, the more you have, the more you cause impairment around you, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, uh, but you, your obsession is so great. Um, you can't say no anymore. Greenland and leptin are like long lost in the dust in the, in the past. Like they're just not, they can't, leptin cannot um, make you feel satisfied enough because dopamine is so big. And then you become dependent, which means that if I stop, I here I am expecting a 400 hit of dopamine, which actually feels like 200. And then if I stop, I'm minus 400. Uh, I'm actually in deficit of dopamine. And that means that I have no interest. I'm tired. I'm not interested in anything. And I don't want, I don't want to go there. So I, I end up having... Um, I end up getting, uh, uh, I can't imagine not having the sugar anymore. And this is, you got the hormonal derangement. And now you've got this, these are two drives. I'm just gonna quickly um, uh, go to uh, the stages. This development that I've just talked about of, of the hormonal, and then uh, you start to kind of behave erratically, but now it's including the addiction piece. You could almost see it like a continuum so that the first part might be just passive overeating. Then you start to get compulsive. Then it becomes, it looks like binge eating disorder. And then it becomes not just compulsive, but um, you're eating despite negative consequences. Like you have the term addiction. It's a whole phenomena. And you could map each of those, that continuum into stages. And these stages we would call early, middle, and late stage food addiction. Late stage food addiction, 
your life is all about the food. And like the heroin addict wakes up in the morning, um, they are, uh, their first thought is, um, I used whatever substance that was available to me. So the, my day now is about getting my substance so that I don't get sick by the end of the day. And then by the end of the day, I got my substance. And then the next day, it's the same thing. It's the same with food. The person wakes up in the morning and um, they are uh, already thinking, what is the food? Do I have enough? And then they eat it. And then it's it's it actually it requires more than it's almost like an hour by hour process, especially when you're in a food addict thing. It's all about the food or about avoiding getting sick or about how to get the next one or how to feel while you're sick. What are you going to do? Like, it's all about the food. That's late stage. And often the person by then is a diabetic and they, they've gained a tremendous amount of weight. So treatment, like I said, this, this, this talk is um, one size fits all. Uh, no, no one size, no one size plan fits all. If you're at the early stage and you're just at the hormonal level um, where it's the insulin, then I would say, which means that you might be able to get away with having sugar once in a while. So I would say, why would you? It's like, why would you start having a few cigarettes if you're not a smoker? Don't even start. But um, uh, it, it is possible if you're not so deranged and you don't expose yourself on a regular basis um, uh, it, it's possible to have um, a, a higher glycemic. This it, Actually, it's for people who want to have honey once in a while, or they want to have dates or some super sweet, a uh, high fructose meal, might be able to get away with it in early stage because they their, their um, hormonal system is not so deranged that they're able to do it. But if you're late stage, no way can you do that. That, that, that would um, just, um, you're, we, your insulin receptors and your dopamine receptors are so impaired that just the slightest rustling or rough ruffling of that is going to put you back into a, a state. Um, so anyway, early stage, uh, it, it's more caution. The way to not continue, because it is a progressive continuum, um, is to uh, stay as much away from refined foods and sugars as you can, preferably none at all, and then you won't continue on. Um, and, and if you're middle stage, it might mean to, in terms of that glycemic index, um, uh, stay around foods that are uh, fruits and vegetables that are not too, um, that, that aren't processed too quickly. Like somebody in early stage might be able to handle a banana banana quite comfortably, but somebody in middle or late stage won't be able to, like, you have to kind of figure out where you fit. And, um, uh, you know, the more you move to late stage, the more you want to curb your carbohydrates, which might be called keto. It doesn't, it, it, it's whatever it is, what, what really trying to do is look at complex carbohydrates should be the key thing. And sometimes removing the carbohydrates, which would be a fast or a keto, which you can do on a vegan plan as well. So the, the further down the line you go, the more extreme the intervention is. Um, but I would say practice a cautious approach right from the beginning and just avoid processed foods and um, sugary foods. Well, I think that's about it. I just want to see if there's anything else. Yeah, these are, these are all the... Just, uh, yeah, I think the bottom line I want to say here is um, you will play it safe. If you are a late stage, definitely abstain from sugar and flour. If you're not a late stage, you don't want to get to a late stage. So just avoid them and keep yourself pro uh, protected. And, and for people who are at late stage, some of the uh, um, other foods which they could tolerate before, they may not be able to tolerate. Like, believe it or not, nuts, which are completely healthy, uh, like why why is that a problem are actually a problem for some people but it's not the hormonal thing it's the addiction thing and sometimes the addiction like you got to watch your hormones and glycemic index and then you have to watch your trigger foods and um if uh, dairy and nuts are a very common trigger food and sweeteners too sweeteners do nothing to insulin or very little but they are a high trigger food so you have to kind of watch on both levels so that's i think that's all i want to talk about uh, Chef AJ, I've talked oh, about that, that is fabulous. Um, I, I I'd love to ask you a few questions if I can. Sure. I've copious yeah. notes, and I'm glad that you mentioned nuts because I know that nuts were a very healthy food. But I I've worked with so many people, myself yeah. included, for whom we just can't have that one ounce of walnuts a day. Yeah. Oh my, and cashews. Oh my God. Yeah. So so what is it about nuts? Because they are whole food. They're found in nature. So yeah. why, why, what, is, what is it about them? 
Yeah, and they're not even processed. So that's the ironic thing. Like it, it doesn't fit on that top category at all. I mean, you could argue nuts are um, a protein, but there is some carbohydrate in it and of course fats. But so that's a, a pretty potent combo. But I think it's more that it's it's a it's a it, that and it's a high trigger. It um, it becomes a trigger food. There's something about the uh, reward value that. Um, right. Well, I'm you know, sure, I'm our, sure ancestors, sure. our ancestors didn't have access to nuts 365 yeah. days a year. They had to open each one. They weren't going to Costco exactly. with three pound exactly. bags of roasted and salt. And I think especially when you add salt to the nut, it makes it even yeah. more yeah. palatable. And probably you, Chef AJ, early days were able to eat nuts more than now. Like it's a progressive thing, right? Yeah, I just, I mean, I just, even, I mean, I could eat them. I have enough now self-control and restraint, but when I eat them, all I do is think about them. It's, I don't exactly. like that feeling. It like bangs on my brains. And and yes. a lot of doctors put me down saying like, they don't believe me and that everybody should yes. eat nuts, but they're not food no. addicts. No, I think, food addicts. I think you actually hit it on the head. Like the way that we were, we ate them um, ancestrally was that we had to crack them open with our teeth and they, they weren't salted and all that stuff. So that, that, and that on that level, yes. Yeah. What, how do you define a trigger food? Yeah, a trigger food. Well, this is this is the thing. So a trigger food is just anything that sparks the dopamine. So a classic example would be a sweetener um, where, you know, there's no there's no insulin uh, consequence, but it reminds me of, of sweet. And so the dopamine is perked. Um, sometimes foods that uh, like my trigger foods are going to be different than yours. Like they end up they have an attachment of value a dopamine value attachment that's been developed over time that um, can flood that that second system, that dopamine system, the uh, the reward pathway. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how else to say it than that. Like, why do some foods become trigger foods? They are associated with an, a pleasurable experience. And then once that happens, uh, people end up finding that like you said, they eat it. And even if they can control it, they want it. it. It's like, it's like dopamine is like an itch. Once there's a little bit of something and it's become itchy, whenever you scratch it, the scratch gets, you just want to scratch it even more. It's, it's a mental urge that gets bigger and bigger. And that's the dopamine. So something is triggering that and why that happens for you is like walnuts don't do it for me at all. Cashews do it. Mm. Peanuts do it. But walnuts, I don't like them that much. So they mm. they would not be a trigger food. So there's something about that. And it's an individual thing. And I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah, it's funny because I don't really particularly care for Brazil nuts. And they say, oh, you have to eat one every day for selenium. But I uh. feel like it's almost, I don't know if you've ever heard this term, a gateway food that I eat yes. one Brazil nut. And then all I think about is, you know, cashews and pistachios absolutely. and peanuts. Yes. And so yeah, thank you for, for doing this, you, you know, as a medical doctor who actually has an inpatient treatment facility for saying that there, that it is normal for some of us to feel this way about certain foods and that they shouldn't be forced upon this even if no, they no. reported and, health benefits. And, and the reason why um, uh, other doctors are, because they're only looking at that first realm of, of, of the, uh, uh, the, the that hormonal realm. And that's actually where all the medication and surgery and everything is focused. The clinical focus is there. But I'm talking about the addiction realm. And that's where the concept and, and the language of trigger foods and people, places, things and cues um, become very important. That's the level that we're talking about right now. And that's not acknowledged in the food world. And I have you ever heard this concept of a gateway food? Yeah. Well, yes, absolutely. I, I, I mean, it's anything that opens the floodgates. So the floodgates is, you know, it, it's this concept of, um, uh, you, you, I don't know if you've heard the term. It, we use this term in the in the addiction world all the time. Um, uh, you know, one drink is too many and a thousand is not enough. So a gateway is you have something and it's too much because it's opened the gate and now nothing is enough. Um, and so that can be the nut for you. That can be a sweetener. And th so then this is why I'm not that crazy about like a lot of these um, places, like even even like super keto stuff, they have these keto bars that are supposed to be safe because they're, but they're sweet. And so then that opens the gateway to now you want more stuff and you can't have it because that's not on your diet. 
uh, it, it, yeah, that's exactly. what it is. It's sort of like the idea of, well, there may not be anything wrong with, you know, guacamole, but then you start thinking about the chips and then you start thinking yes. about the margarita. Yes. Whereas if exactly. you didn't have the guacamole, you might not be thinking about those other two things that maybe- Those are all have. associations. And that's the that's the triggers uh, and people, places, things. That's that whole associational thing. And that's really important. If I can just stress the importance of that. Uh, it, we're talking addiction now. And, and I see so many times that somebody will go into jail for their heroin addiction and they're, they're not getting heroin in jail. I know that you can get drugs in jail, but they're not. And they're not on meth. They're not on, they're clean. When they come out six months later, they're clean. But the moment they get out, what do they do? They see Fred that they used to use with. They go back to their old neighborhood. They go back to their doing nothing because they uh, they didn't have a job and they don't have something set up. It's really hard to do that. Um, and so then everything is the same. All of the associations are the same. And they use again. And they go, why did I do that? Because there's that whole subterranean uh, uh psychological addiction level and that's what we're talking about here it is potent is it more potent it's probably equivalent to the physical um, drug addiction itself yeah so and that's why that's why we don't they, they, sorry to interrupt you oh, no, 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 not at all the, the food industry knows that and so you can be on a diet and then you go into a movie and they pump in the smell of uh, popcorn and stuff and now you want a popcorn like like they do this deliberately. i know they oh my gosh that's so food. funny that you said that because i don't eat popcorn not just because it's calorically dense at 1800 calories per pound or it's a hand-to-mouth food which dr joe okay. Nichols says isn't good for people that struggle with food addiction because right. quite a while ago, I, I got angry at popcorn because I was eating it during a movie and I broke a crown. And so that, uh, was, that was like $1,500 back then. Yeah. So I just stopped eating popcorn. But um, my veterinarian said, I have a, a little dog like you and she gained a pound. And a pound may not seem like a lot, but when you <laughs> weigh 12 pounds, it's a lot. It's like 25, yeah. you know, it's, it's so, so, but I go, she begs all the time. What should we give her? And she said, just give her air pop popcorn. And so we make it for her. And oh my God, it's like, all I want to do is eat my dog's popcorn. Uh, yeah. smell. And it's, it's, it's so interesting how, you know, you, you can recall those memories, even from a food you maybe haven't had in many, many years. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. How prevalent do you think right. food addiction is? So ask me that question again. How prevalent do you think it oh. is? Because I think it's underdiagnosed because so many clinicians, including medical doctors, don't like the term. And so they don't even use it yeah. or, or identify it in their patients. Yeah, the, well, uh, so the prevalence is is hard because we we haven't been measuring it. But actually, there is somebody now who's who's um, doing a lot more of that. Ashley Gerhardt, who came up with the Yale Food uh, um, uh, Food Addiction Inventory. So she's actually got a tool and has been being very um, um, active about measuring it. And so her most recent estimate is somewhere between i think i think i, I think our, the term mostly is about 14% sort of 11 to 14% which by the way is equivalent to um alcoholism in society so about 11 to 14% but if you look at people that are um it, it, specific populations like the obese population it's much higher it's like 30 to 50 percent. And now we're getting into larger numbers and it's not so clear exactly, but generally speaking. But if you think about our, our, our Canadian um, American population, well, two thirds of the population are obese. So that way we could probably say 20 to 30 or, or, or like you said, probably more. 30 to 40 percent of our population is food addicted. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes it boggles the mind to know. So, we People. see that women can be more so middle-aged women more uh, i mean it's it, it there's different various populations so it's anywhere from the most cautious 14 to percent all the way up to 30 or 40 percent right because we didn't used to have the obesity rates that we have now you know no. when my grandparents were alive i saw my, yeah. my grandfather was a doctor and i can look at his graduation picture from medical school I, there wasn't one overweight person yes i know i know it's it's yes I know. And so our genetics couldn't have changed that quickly. No, so no, it has to be food. the food. Yeah, it, it is the food. It, it is the food. I, I mean, it's the same with diabetes. We didn't have the rates of diabetes in our grandparents' population. There was some, but nothing like today. And, you know, we 
certainly didn't have it in the young population. Like, you know, in my generation, we were calling type two diabetes mature onset. Now right. forget Adult it. It's, onset it's, now, it, yeah, exactly. Teenagers and kids. So, so I, don't know if you, I don't know if you know Dr. Joel Furman. He's written a book that I think you should read if you haven't called Fast Food Genocide. He's a big believer in the plant-based world in food addiction. Mm -hmm. But he says that Americans eat something like 72% of their calories from ultra processed food. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. And that's, that's, yeah, scary. And, and less than 10% from fruits and vegetables. And so I think yeah. part of the problem isn't so much calling it a diagnosis of food addiction. I think the problem is that we're calling the things that are people that are eating them that are making them sick. Yeah. Well, I don't know why it's even called food. Yeah, I know. And his term fast food genocide is is perfect because that is exactly what's happening. Like he he hit it right on the head. And and the most recent version of that, I guess, is the Ultra Processed uh, People book, which is excellent book talking about uh, the very same thing, but I guess with more more recent research and whatnot. But the same idea exactly. We would solve a lot of our problems not by medications and surgery, but by changing our food. And it, it has to be, we have to, we have to call upon the food industry, but they won't do it. They, they, it's an industry, they're making money and they're calling it food and you're right. It's not food, it's food products. It's, it's not food. I understand why people don't like the term food addiction. Nobody wants to think of themselves as an addict, even if they are, but why are clinicians so reticent to accept this as a, as a disease? I, I, I don't know. I, I, okay. I could say it's because the food industry has a hand and the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry has a hand in the profit. So the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry, um, you know, funds doctors, it funds research and uh, funds education. Like it just does. That's what it, that's what it does. And so doctors uh, are taught by the pharmaceutical and the food industry, basically their information. And, and I, I don't think that doctors are sitting there going, um, I, 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 I I know myself when I was a younger doctor, I was convinced that I was not persuaded by the pharmaceutical stuff that I was given and by, you know, the food industry. I, I was persuaded. I thought I was just following good research. I didn't realize that the research itself is chosen by the pharmaceutical industry. And there's no benefit from the pharmaceuticals. I, like the, the most recent the most recent phenomena, Ozempic, which is this drug that everyone is taking to lose weight and to deal with their diabetes, like that is where the medical profession is going. That's what doctors are talking about. But we could get the same effect by eating better foods. We don't need to go to the, that expense. Um, and it could be used as it was before somebody cottoned on to make this a, a big money maker just for diabetics, the, the extreme cases where, where dietary changes were not enough. But now it's become the answer. So why? Because of that. So you ask, why do doctors not uh, get this? They're not told and they will be standing out of the standard of practice and they don't want to do that. Oh, yeah. um, and also they may suffer from it as well. Exactly. That might be why, but it, like why they won't on an individual basis, I think because it's, it's not a norm. Like, like it, as long as we continue to laugh about it and dismiss it, um, nobody wants to, they don't want to be seen as the addict doesn't want to see themselves as an addict and the doctor doesn't want to see themselves as an outlier talking about something that sounds ridiculous because it's made to look ridiculous. Yeah, abso absolutely. Because processed food has been around, what do you think, since at least about World War II, would you say? Yeah, that's right. But yeah. I don't think Americans were using it as their prime calorie source like they are now. No, absolutely. Absolutely. No, and it, so if they weren't, people may not have developed this addiction and might have been able to have a muffin occasionally. Or exactly. Yeah, that's right. And that's what they did 100 years ago. Like 100 years ago, our grandparents um, did make you know, cakes and stuff like that. But the, the, there wasn't the expectation that you would eat it every day or instead every day of, and every meal. That's the yeah, other thing. Yeah. yeah like it really was once in a while. And yes, we can handle that occasional um, blitz to the system, but we can't handle the way that we're doing it now. Exactly. And, and we're, there, we're getting diabetes and we're getting addiction, both as consequences. Is there a way to tell in advance if you're a person vulnerable to this? Because my husband eats very healthy, but he's one of those people that could have a dessert if he wanted. He chooses yeah. most of the time not to. Is there a way to tell? I mean, I think people kind of know, can self-diagnose, yeah. but is there a way to like tell in advance? Like, so if you have this child before you start, you know, putting 
Coca-Cola in their sippy cup, you could say, hey, you're really going to be exposed to this, you know? Oh, my God. Don't put the Coca-Cola in the sippy cup. Oh, that's what they do at Costco. I, I see I parents know. Do all the time. I know, but they are predisposing the kid, not just to food addiction, but other addictions. Because sugar, you mentioned gateway, is a gateway to other drugs. Like, don't do this. And it, it's been normalized so that it's okay. It's like putting know, People a don't take it seriously milk. because yeah. it's readily available, easily affordable, socially right. You always, you know, soccer games and, you know, it, it's just, it's so normalized that we're the yeah. ones that are considered odd that we yeah. have to abstain from it. But it is equivalent to putting a cigarette in a kid's mouth, uh, which we wouldn't do now. We might have done it actually 25 years ago and thought it was cute, but now we would just not do that anymore. And we got to do that with sugar too. So is, is there a way to know? Well, you don't want to do that no matter what, but there, there are some, some uh, I, tools. I mean, you can be predisposed. Because if if mom is, um, I mean, they're not going to say sugar addict, but if mom is a diabetic, if there's diabetes in the family, if there's obesity in the family, these are all indications of predisposition um, uh, right there. Uh, if mom ate a lot of sweets during pregnancy, she's predisposing that kid to having a preference for sweets. So those are some signs. But basically, like you said, we usually know. And um, if a person you know, fulfill some of the criteria, like, do I eat more than I want to? I can't control it. Do I think about it more than I want to? Do I eat in a way that's embarrassing? I don't want to tell people what I'm eating. Do I lie? All of those things. Those are the same questions we ask when a person is using cocaine or alcohol. We use it with food too. You know, so many people think it's unrealistic to abstain from sugar, especially permanently. And, uh, you know, you know, kids should be able to eat what they want at a birthday party or at school. So where do you stand on this discussion of abstinence versus moderation or maybe harm reduction, if you will? Um, well, because I'm an addiction doctor and I'm seeing people end stage, I have to um, uh, promote abstinence. Um, and uh, if we were living in a society that didn't normalize this stuff, it's like we were saying earlier. Um, I think that being being very first, I don't believe in this concept of let the kid decide themselves. They can't decide themselves. The kids don't have that ability. It's like asking the kid to decide if they can drink alcohol or or, or marijuana or cigarettes. You don't let it. It's our job to protect our kids. So if if the kid has only a little bit of sugar, like only on holidays and stuff, they probably won't develop into something. And then they could do moderation as, as we were saying, but I see people not at the beginning stages. So I understand that approach. Let's be careful and, and, and moderate and um, use foods, choose, choose the foods we give our kid. Um, but once, once the person's at a particular stage, I don't think there's any moderation possible. I think it has to be abstinence. And that might even be a kid who's developed, to that extent. So it depends on the, that's why I say not one size fits all, but usually at, at a certain level, sugar has to go, <laughs> processed food has to go because a little bit is it then opens the floodgates. It's that gateway. Do you think after a long period of abstinence and recovery, people can dabble and re try to reintroduce it maybe in a clinical setting or under medical supervision? I personally don't think so. I know that some people think that, but I, I have not seen much success in that. What I see is a person says, well, I had a little bit and I'm okay. But then in a year or two, I see them and then they're not okay anymore. It may not hit you right away, but um, uh, it, it does seem to eventually. And then it comes back with a vengeance. It's not worth it, I would say. And, right. if, and if you're willing to take that chance, then I'd say, well, that's 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 a craving in disguise, you, something is telling you, even at the risk of destroying my peace of mind, I wanna try this. Uh, I, I question that. So maybe you can have sweetener again, maybe you can have um, maybe some foods that you couldn't, trigger foods you could try again, but I would not go to the extent of sugar. Or, right, uh, it's kind of like that concept of once a, once a pickle, now yes. a cucumber. I thought that I believe that, but that's, that's my perspective. Yeah. I know not everybody, yeah. does it, and, but I've seen, I've seen too many people relapse and then they get worse. It's just not absolutely. worth it. Absolutely. And, and um, sometimes the longer they go without, the more intense it is once they reintroduce it. Yes, exactly. That's what happens. Yeah. 
exactly and they, what happens. They, and they get they get uh, right back into that pleasure trap and that cycle of addiction. Yeah, and, and this is what you know. People lose weight; they they feel great. Then they have a little bit because they've lost weight, and then now they they gain the weight back plus more, and then they lose it again. And that's what's happening. Yeah. It just gets worse. Each if you time. haven't read the pleasure trap, I really recommend it. Yeah. I did audio I for it because I I, I, yeah. I live my life by those principles. And you know, for people, I understand that absence is hard. And when people book. say that, when people say absence is hard, I say to them, "Well, living as an addict is hard too. You know, maybe even harder." Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when I talked about the end stage food addict, that's not a happy person. That's not a person enough. that's miserable. And and is like I don't know what I can't help myself anymore. Yeah. It, it, did you did you happen to see the um, last year's uh, the Academy Award winner Brendan Fraser for the movie Whale? He was a, a yes. I mean that to yeah. me not, not not I don't mean just his size because there you know food addiction can come in many sizes. There are people that don't yes. even are overweight, but yes. you know just when you watched him eat that pizza, it was just like I it, and that was that's probably why he won the Academy Award. I. Yeah feel so bad for people that are still caught in the throes of food addiction. Yeah. Those of us that have gotten to the other side know what's possible. And it's just, it just, yeah. I, I would like to tell people, you know, there's hope don't, don't give up because. Yeah. I, and you know, in, in that movie, it wasn't just the pizza that he was eating and how he felt, but he let his daughter abuse him, like be abusive to him. Like a person's sense of self-worth is so low. Yeah. It's, it's it, because addiction, how can you feel good about yourself when you can't, you can't control even the most basic things. It's 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 very demoralizing. And yes, I I, I think uh, Chef AJ, we should end on a positive note that um, when you stop the when you discover what your trigger foods are, please start with sugar first and process refined uh, carbs. Um, then uh, uh, and you actually abstain from them. There is actually a, a feeling of huge relief. It might take the withdrawal might take I don't know ten days, twenty days, tops. And then you're on the other side and you will feel free. And that's a freedom that's not deprivation. It's free. <laughs> it's do, you, free. do you feel like it's just pure sugar addiction or it's a combination of sugar and fat, sugar and salt, sugar, fat, and salt? Because the people well, that I yeah. see, it's it's all the refined carbohydrates. Like I don't yeah. see somebody that has pretty good health and it's just soda pop, for example. It's It seems like it, the, the combination of sugar with the fat, sugar with the flour, sugar with the... Yeah altogether seems to be a more deadly and addictive combination for yeah it, it it is a more addictive definitely but it, it the other one can exist like i actually have seen people who just do soda like they do like 10 pot 10 cans a day or something and then that's where they get their like literally they smoke cigarettes and they do soda that's it uh yeah. and uh, maybe a little bit of food in between there somewhere oh but, but yes and sometimes it's that, diet that, soda which isn't i mean yeah. as bad as soda is I've, I've heard that diet soda is even worse those zero calorie sweeteners and uh, fake sweeteners yeah yeah exactly because it's it, it kicks in the dopamine which is the addictive thing yeah, yeah. people don't eat any less when they when they use zero calorie sweeteners no. i think they're fooling yeah. themselves yeah that's right you know, one of the things you said in the beginning, again, pretty much I agree with everything you said, but one of the things you said in the beginning, and I'm, I need more clarification is that for the carrots can be addictive. I mean, these are these people literally eating nothing but carrots? No, no, no. But so that that's an example of an end stage where even behaviors themselves, like the, it's not actually the carrots that are, are uh, addictive. It's the crunch. It's the eating all the time. And they've designated that the carrots are, because carrots are a little bit sweeter than celery. Um, so they're getting a little bit of sweet, but th that's an addictive behavior, but it's not actually the carrot, but they, they, they need to eat something. And, um, you can eat carrots for a long time before you fill up because there's a lot of crunching. Well, they're very low in caloric density. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. But the, it, so it's the crunch, it's the need to, it's basically like grazing the whole day, but more than grazing. And that kind of behavior can also be quite, because addiction is just when you can't stop something despite impairment yeah. and they, they can get yellow skin like they can literally get um to the point where it's hyperkeratinemia yeah 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 now it's not as bad as a diabetes but it's still uh, uh it's it's a residual or a remnant of a, a addiction so why don't you just tell us about your class okay okay right right uh okay so my class all of the stuff that i've talked about uh, is covered in the class, but in greater depth. So my class is called Sugar and, um, my gosh, Sugar and Food Addiction, and it's hosted by Adapt Your Life uh, Academy. And uh, it's a, 
class, it's a video tutorial of about 14 videos uh, that walk you through sugar addiction and food addiction on the various levels. So the biology that I talked about, uh, as well as um, the development of the stages and then why it is that foods uh, are appropriate in some levels and not in others. And then I talk a little bit about once you see food as an addiction, um, you have all sorts of addictive tools that you can apply. And so I list what those tools are. So if you're interested in food addiction, both as a client or a person, or you're working in the field and you want to work in the field, you'll get a, a good sense of the uh, research and the, the tools and the understanding of food addiction. It's, it works out to being about three hours of, of um, 20 minute lectures, something like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, it covers all that stuff. Fantastic. And I hope you'll give us all the information and we'll put it right below in the show notes so Thank people you. can register. And and it's it, the, there is a registration time. It's, um I can't remember, I think it's September 30th. It's only a week that you can register for. Right. So please make sure you give us everything and we'll put it yes. right below in the show notes and people can click on the links. I've thank taken, you. it's a fabulous class. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tarman. Thank you. And thanks, thanks, all you for watching another, thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous show.